Carl and Liam here from Games, Brains and Headbang Life, GBHBL.com for sure. And it is getting goosebumps as we are up to second episode of season three of the TV series. The 46th episode overall. It is also the 57th book in the original Goosebump book series that was first published in 1997. What's really interesting about this is this premiered on TV in 1997 as well, later in the year. So it came well, right off the book. That's a short turnaround. Really, really was. But it makes a lot of sense when you kind of see how the episode plays out. Because I saw the word invisible and went, no. Yeah, not again. Not again. <laughs> exactly. Not again. Not again. Give them credit. It is a bit different overall. But it is one of those with one of those twists that is dumb because there's no way in hell you could ever have seen this come and you couldn't have guessed, you couldn't have ever predicted in a million years. It actually reminds me of the Werewolf of Fever. No, is it the Werewolf of Fever? No, the season one one about the camp. The camp one. Yeah, yeah. Wait, Welcome to uh, Camp Nightmare. It, it, welcome to Camp Nightmare, exactly, yeah. Where the that twist is just sense. so ludicrous. It's yeah. so ludicrous. But I actually love the twist in this, actually. When we get to it, I'll discuss it further. But it is like one of those, I don't know how they keep doing it. I have to say, like these twists with Goosebumps, man. you got to give them R.L. Stein some credit, man. Even though they are, sometimes they're just so random, you can never see them coming. But I don't know, I still think like it works. And I've got some positivity to speak about it once we get to it anyway. <laughs> it's not that I dislike the twist. It's that the fact that, that's, that, as you said, ludicrous is the right word you use to choose it. We won't, well, so we'll touch upon it, but there is an element of it that I dislike so heavily, it kind of ruined the whole episode for me. But we'll, okay. we'll get to that. Yep. Guess who's back in the directing chair for this one? It's William Fruitt. Uh, probably the most consistent director we've had. Familiar sounding name now. It is, and it was written by Scott Peters. The cast, John Davy as Sam Jacobs, Daylene Irvine as Roxanne, Darcy Weir as Brent Green, and the adults, Ted Simonet as Norman Jacobs and Arlene Mazzaroli as Beverly Jacobs, Mr. and Mrs. Jacobs. Uh, factoids for this, very little of interest except one, which is there is uh, a scene on a TV playing when Sam wakes up in this Goosebumps episode. It's a brief shot and it shows a common harvester smashing out of a barn. If you know your goosebumps, you know where that's from. That is, of course, from the Scarecrow Walks at Midnight in that batshit ending of that. Yeah. <laughs> we begin, it's night inside a house. And it's like, well, there's one tick in the box. I was generally shocked it didn't have narration because I was like, where's, where, I expect a narration. <laughs> For the record, two episodes in, no opening narration from a kid. Shocked. Mercifully so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But we do see two kids. We are introduced to Sam, which is John Davy and Roxanne Daly and Weir. And they're trying to get a peek at Sam's scientist parents as they work inside their lab. What is with these people having home labs? What's with these scientist parents, man? It's, that's another very, that's becoming a serious consistency as well, is the science, the wacky scientist parents is a lot, yeah. Tie into that, scientist parents that are doing research and stuff that they can't talk about. Can't tell you. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so why are Sam and Roxanne peering in? It's so they can see if their his parents, his parents are busy and distracted, which they are, allowing the kids to sneak out of the house and go to a place called Hedge House. I mean, are you even trying? Are you even trying? <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> Once there, Sam then reveals himself to be this episode's chicken shit as a legend surrounding a ghost is brought God, up. God, make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> and they go inside, the house is abandoned, and I'll give them credit, this house looks abandoned. I bought into that. Yeah, it's true, yeah. They start to look mm -hmm. around, and it seems as though Roxanne is leading this hunt, as she basically wants to get a ghost on camera for the term project. Mm -hmm. And this... <clears throat> uh, I went, oh, mate, this makes no sense. So you believe ghosts are real then? Because a term mm -hmm. project is obviously something important. You have to do it. You're going to have to submit something. So you're expecting to actually get footage of a ghost, right? Uh, yeah, I want to lower expectations on that one. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Let's go. And no term project's worth this. But anyway, Sam points out, what does she think is going to happen? A ghost is just going to walk up and pose for her. And I was like, yes, Sam, exactly. You're, you're the voice of reason. <laughs> but she walks off, leaving him alone in the living room. And because we, it's a short runtime, we need to get somewhere fast. We immediately see that behind them, a glove rises on its own and draws a smiley face in a dirty mirror above him. And then falls to the mantle afterwards, startling him, and he sees the face. But you do get this cool thing where he almost can't be sure. Like, he's unsure if it was there already. Like, he didn't look at it before, so he's kind of like, mm, yeah. And I don't mind that. No, I like that. Roxanne. Roxanne comes back, they head upstairs. Up there, they hear some creepy noises. We then get kind of a classic horror movie thing as a table on wheels rolls towards them. Um, and for some reason, this part, they're like, eh. They're very dismissive of this rolling table. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it also has a cloche on it. Uh, so Roxanne goes to take it off while Sam films. And I'm like, come on, the head. Come on, the disembodied head. But no, it's a note. Just a note. It reads, I'm ready for my close-up and a door behind slam shut. That's enough for Sam. And be honest, man, you ain't got to be a chicken shit to be a bit like, yeah, I'm, I, Sam's being reasonable here. This is some messed up shit. Yeah. But apparently Roxanne fears nothing. And she's like, no, nah, I'm going inside that room. The one with the door that just slammed, I'm going in there. So immediately I was like, I don't remember this episode. I don't remember the story. I'm like, she's a ghost. It's her. She's dead. She was dead all along. <laughs> like, you, you know what I mean? I'm watching too much Goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, there's something. Inside there's nothing but a leather chair, but Roxanne spins it around to find another note with the word boo written on it. And she is so unimpressed. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Also, I'm not. I'm just thinking, like, based on what the twist is to come, whether or not this, like, this sort of stuff even makes any sense, mm. considering, yeah. But anyway, it may not, but you're right. But then we get um, one of the worst CGI CGI effects seen in a while. As out of the shadows, a CGI clown mask comes screaming out, and that's our fade to black. I'm like, yeah, that's not only is it a, I think it might be the worst CGI effect, but also. I think it is the worst fade to black so far like the worst one because they're just not even trying man i mean i know we had the one before with the garden gnome which is definitely up there as well this is this is pretty bad <laughs> i also thought they forgot about the fade to black i thought oh we're actually doing something different because this is really far into the episode that is yeah. <clears throat> it is it's just a chair boo is this supposed to scare us? When we come back, we immediately come back and you're like, right, well, what happened with that clown mask? And you're like, wait, they're back at Sam's house and they seem fine. And apparently Roxanne didn't see the clown mask floating. She only saw a mask, which she now has in her hand. And I'm like, the fuck happened there? Not good. <laughs> Yeah, and she then insists that we go back much to Sam's chagrin before going home. I'm, I'm like, look, Sam, you, she can't force you, right? Like, you know she can't force you. Yeah. <laughs> Sam is asleep, but is woken by a sound below. He gets out of bed to check, thinking it's his parents, and we see something is watching him from below with a kind of, like, wavy vision thing going on. Not like predator vision or anything like that. It's just a bit like wavy lines at the sides. Mm, yeah. Sam finds the noise is coming from an open window banging in the wind. This is a very windy episode, I will say. People should probably <laughs> close their windows occasionally. They should. <laughs> he backs off in fear to find a rocking chair moving behind him. He turns the light on and it stops. Boom. There you go. That's a good scare. That reminds me of the Evil Dead. That's true. Yeah, yep. I did a little bit. Mm. Yeah, just a good classic scare. He backs under the kitchen where a door swings open and it leads to his parents' lab. 
Sam goes down calling for his parents and is startled by his father. His father reminds him that he shouldn't be down here and to go back to bed. You're like, okay, this is classic goosebump stuff. Stay out of the basement, kid, basically. Mm -hmm. Sam asks some questions about his dad's work, though, in particular, a container that holds some sort of, some sort of unusual light. His dad says he can't tell him, but does reveal it is for seeing things that are hard to see. And you're like, ah, well, that's coming back later on. Don't touch that. What, what is it? It's a secret. I can't talk about it. It looks like some kind of light. What does it do? It's for seeing things that are hard to see. Look, I've told you more than I should already. Go to bed. We then get what I consider to be the episode's best scene. One that I generally think is creepy and unnerving. Mm -hmm. Sam goes back to his bedroom to open his door to find his room has basically been trashed in utter disarray. And it's like, oh, that's good. That is good. Yeah, I like that, yeah. Uh, again, I've got a reference, a uh, classic horror movie. It sort of reminded me of like the sort of poltergeist scene of all the turning around and the cupboard doors are all open. It's just unnerving. Yeah, or like maybe think of the scene in the sixth sixth sense, I believe, is where the mother leaves the kitchen and she comes back in afterwards, and the whole kitchen's been like wrecked. Yep, yep, it's really yeah. good stuff. He calls Roxanne, who answers and tells him that he thinks something followed him home, and we kind of know he's right because we get that vision of something watching him from inside the room now. The next day at school, resident ghost expert Roxanne is telling him that ghosts don't follow people home. Uh, he rightfully points out that she doesn't know that. I'm like, yeah, fucking right. Who the fuck <laughs> made you a boss? And I'm th all I'm thinking is it's because she's a ghost. I'm, I'm convinced yeah. she's a ghost. That's, that must be what it is. She must be right. <laughs> yep. He says that he will never be able to sleep again. And we get one of my favorite things, a wonderful cut to a stormy night at his house where his parents are asleep in a couch, couch and he's struggling to stay awake watching TV. And I did like that. It's like, I'm never going to sleep again. Instant cut mm -hmm. to him basically falling asleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is where we get the Combine Harvester scene from uh, Scarecrow Walks at Midnight. And it actually snaps him out of his fugue state. Uh, but he's so tired, he kind of slips back into it. Lightning crashes because it's a stormy, stormy night. And he snaps out of it again. But this time, his parents are gone. Mm. Now, at this point, I actually got annoyed of him. Because we'd already had several scenes of him just constantly calling out for his parents. And he goes up for it again, and I'm like, he's calling up his parents, like, hey, man, maybe they got up and thought, oh, Sam's asleep. Let's go upstairs and bang. <laughs> some private time. And, it's, he's, and he's not even like a baby. Like, mom, dad, where are you constantly? And it's like, if you're always fucking parents, but like, oh, for fuck's sake, man, will you give us five minutes to ourselves? Man, I, I, you know, I don't think it's supposed to ever go there, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> We do see he's being watched and followed again. The storm outside blows in from an open window. Close your windows, uh, <laughs> causing him to run upstairs. In his room, he puts a chair under the door handle as the mysterious watcher approaches. Cowering in his bed, Sam Connolly watches fear as his toys shake and something approaches him. Then we get uh, another pretty poor effect of a spaceship that's one of his toys picked up, floats in the air, heads towards him before changing direction and going into the closet, right? That's crap. Yeah. However, they do a brilliant job of when the closet doors are open of creating this void of darkness in there. I thought that was brilliant. It yeah, looks like so that. dark. I thought it was creepy, for sure. But it's ruined by that fucking floating clown mask effect again. What is the relevant? What is the relevance of the flying clown mask? Is ever explained? No, nope, no. Nope, but I did kind of go with a it reference because it laughs and light comes from its nose. I'm like dead lights. That's, that's, what, what, that's, what, the, that's what it's all. That's what the whole thing's inspired by, man, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam then wakes up in bed. He's confused, but his um, 
stress relieving things. He's got one of those things, I can't what they're called, uh, that balls knock at each end. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that starts to move on its own. And I was a bit like, why has he got that? Like, uh, that's normally done to relieve stress and to focus your mind and stuff like that. He gets out of bed and stops when we hear a kid saying that he was playing with that. Sam turns the light on and demands to know who spoke. The voice says that he is the ghost of Hedge House and that he wants to hang out with Sam, that they can be friends, but Sam isn't so sure. Now, I, I, I am speed rolling through this conversation because it's a long one, but it basically amounts to this. Yeah, I thought, okay, this is a bit different. It's obviously not, a, I was like, it's obviously not a ghost then, but I was intrigued by it. Yeah. What, what do you want? That depends. Uh, are, are you a ghost? Yes, I'm the ghost of Hedge House. Please, please don't kill me. Hmm, I never thought about killing you. Forget, forget I said it. You know, Sam, it might be kind of cool to hang out with you for a while. The next day, or sometime later, it is not very clear how much time has elapsed here, Sam seems to have gotten used to the ghost and has invited Roxanne to meet round to meet him. She, who apparently wanted to find the ghost and was convinced they were real, is very dismissive now, mocking the fact that the ghost is called Brent. So the voice of Brent is this Darcy Weir. Sam wants Brent to juggle some eggs to show her that he is real, but when he tells Brent to do it, Brent doesn't, making Sam look like a bit of a fool. Yeah. Roxanne mocks him as Sam and sister is telling the truth and you see behind her the eggs start to spin in the air but when she turns around they're right back where they were before. She leaves and Sam angrily confronts Brent about his behaviour and Brent does one of those awful goosebump jokes pointing out that Sam can't take a yolk. Turn no. off. Don't laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At school, in class, Sam is still insisting that Brent is real. He gets the attention of the teacher, who then drags him up to the board to convert fractions, which now follows one of the more unusually edited scenes, I think, because he's taken up to convert fractions, and the class apparently think this is hilarious. Just look at the faces of the kids. Nobody bothered to match this up. Nobody bothered to make it seem like they were actually laughing. A lot of the kids aren't even smiling. Um, and we have this laugh. It's basically a laugh track. Mm, something they added in afterwards, in clearly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sam goes to the board, but doesn't know the answers. Uh, so Brent seems to possess him or grab his body and starts to fill in the answers for Sam. Consent, mate, because Sam is not okay with this. This is not, <laughs> this is, this is, you need to get some consent, Brent. Brent, get yourself in trouble, get yourself cancelled. <laughs> it's true. The laughter continues all through the scene. If you listen to it as well, one of them is a grown man. Clearly a grown man. So he didn't even fucking try with this. Weird. Go! I don't need your help. <laughs> 12 over 18 is... <laughs> <laughs> Brent finishes the fractions, let's go of Sam's body, but all the answers are wrong, resulting in, guess what? Laughter. Apparently, this is a hilarious scene. Sam, being an absolute melt, then proceeds to do the stupid, stupid thing of claiming that it wasn't him, it was a ghost. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that goes down as well as you can, you know, expect. Yeah. <laughs> there is one good scene here and it's Roxanne's embarrassed face she does a great whole like oh I'm not with him I'm not with him <laughs> face uh, I did like that Yeah. Sam is told to take a seat as we hear Brent apologise as Brent says look I was never that good at math so I was like okay yeah that's at least a little tongue in cheek later in the cafeteria we have some bullies because you know it's goosebumps we haven't seen a couple of bullies for a while but they do bully him in, a, in a, a thoughtful way. They push Sam's face into his dessert and then claim a ghost did it. And I was like, ah, I see what you did there, guys. Good one. 
Sam's too much of a baby to do anything, but Brent is like, I'm not standing for that. Uh, picks up some sort of cream roll, I think, and then throws it on the bigger bully and it splatters all over him. I couldn't work out what it was because it looks like a cream roll, mm. but then when it hits the bully, it's like custard almost. So that's true. <laughs> as he turns around, the bully makes probably the episode's weirdest sound. It's supposed to be like a, but that's <laughs> not what comes out of his mouth. It's a bit more like a, a grunt, but it just sounded weird. Mm. We then, uh, we then do another really cool cut as we cut to Sam in the bathroom, trying to clean himself up basically after being covered in food. And we're like, yeah, that works. Yeah, that was quite funny. Brent is trying to justify his actions as Sam's friend, but Sam goes on a rant telling Brent that he isn't his friend and that actually he's his worst nightmare and tells him that he wants Brent gone. And Brent's like, hey, he's clearly hurt. If we're not friends, I will be your worst nightmare. And I was really intrigued by this. I was like, oh, he's going to fuck shit up. You weren't supposed to do anything. What kind of friend would I be if I let him get away with that? You're not my friend. What are you saying, Sam? I'm saying you're not my friend. You're my worst nightmare. I want you out of my house and out of my life. You're exactly right, Sam. I'm not your friend. I've never been your friend. I'm your worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. It's definitely intriguing. Yeah. That night, Roxanne arrives with a video camera ready to go back to the house, but Sam insists that he's never going back to the house. To another fantastic cut of him being immediately back in the house. <laughs> I really love when they do that, and they do a lot of them in this episode, but each one works quite nicely. Mm. Although I would like to know what convinced him to go back to the house. So what I would like them to do is cut him back in the house and him going, oh, I can't believe you made me come back here. You better, you better do what you said you'd do. That'd have been, yeah, that'd have been nice if they yeah. added that in. In the house, the noises are pretty full on. And they open the door, resulting in strong blue light coming out. And I'm like, okay, that was a weird one. Roxanne is over the moon thinking the place is really haunted and Sam just wants to leave. And this is a glaring error, in my opinion, because this scenes rely on one thing more than any other, which is Sam seemingly forgetting that Brent exists. Mm. Like, he knows Brent exists. Why is he acting like it's the same situation it was when they were first in the house? That's true. They open another door and find signs that someone has been living or squatting inside. And I was like, oh my God, they're about to get killed by a homeless junkie. <laughs> that's where we're going. <laughs> so your expectations. No, that's not the case because Trent rips the... Trent? No. Oh, I'm thinking of someone else apparently. Brent. Brent. <laughs> yes, rips the video camera out of Sam's hand and speaks scaring Roxanne. He smashes the camera as Sam fearfully introduces the pair. She says hello before running off screaming. And I'm like, I don't get you. I don't get you one bit. Like you thought you, you, you clearly believed in ghosts so mm. much when you thought it was haunted all of two minutes ago, you were excited. Now there is a ghost. You're like, no, nope, running away. And it's not, you can do the whole, oh, it's because she never really believed in ghosts. And now there's one there. No, she was insistent upon finding a ghost for her term fucking paper so which is it it's true <laughs> sam tries to make a run for it but brent is chasing him down sam does manage to make it home but brent does force his way inside this scene i'm even trying to hold the door is done really fucking well i'd love to know yeah. how he did the effect because he's, he's not even he's using his full body but there's clearly no one else on the other side so mm, drops that's to true. them that's a good point his parents hear the commotion and come running sam tells them that there's a ghost in the house as we reach the twist part of the episode, his parents whisper amongst themselves that there are more of them out there and they never thought they'd come here. And you're like, ooh, what's going on? They know something. Ooh. I knew there was some out there. I just never thought they'd come here. We better do something about it. This could traumatize Sam. In his room, Brent is just throwing stuff at Sam. Did quite enjoy the fact that he literally just lobbing shit at him. It's like, okay. Mm. And his parents arrive with some sort of torch, turning the lights off and basically looking for Brent. His dad tells Sam that it's not a ghost 
and shines a light in the corner, revealing a young boy who fades in the vision. This is Brent. And you're like, okay, all right. So it wasn't a ghost. It was someone that was invisible. That's an interesting twist. Behave. That ain't even the fucking close to the actual <laughs> twist. More to come. Please don't hurt me. Brent? It's a human, Sam. Yeah, because Brent begs them not to hurt him, and Sam wonders what he is. Are you ready for this insanity? <laughs> the twist is Brent is human. Yes. Yes. Sam and his parents aren't. They arrived on Earth years ago, enslaved humanity, and sent whoever survived off to space colonies and you're like what <laughs> <laughs> what but wait there's more it's because brent says his parents turn him invisible as a way for him to survive what so we could do that and how is that him surviving he still has to he, like he's human he says only human stuff yeah um, Sam's parents tell Brent that he won't hurt him, but he doesn't believe him. Frustrated, they turn around and we get to see their alien faces in what I now consider to be the worst effect in Goosebumps of all time. Mm -hmm. Basically, superimposed faces on their hair, on the back of their heads. It is fucking horrendous. It looks <laughs> so stupid because of their hair. It's, I think it's dumb. It reminded me of that angry orange thing from a couple, like a decade ago. Yeah. It's a, it's a truly awful effect. And it really brings down what I think is a pretty, like, you know, impactful twist, even though it's like random as fuck, but it's like, yeah. We did it to help you, Brent. To save you from the others. We won't hurt you, Brent. We promise. <laughs> Considering we've had earlier episodes where people's faces just transform, in a CGI kind of transformation. Why did you do this? Why didn't you just do that? I mean, I don't, I have not read this book, so I don't know if this is R.L. Stein's ending uh, to the book, like exactly the same sort of thing. And they were like, no, we want to keep it accurate. But it's like, if this is what it is in the book as well, it's probably pretty dumb. But you, I guess if it was done with not CGI, crappy looking faces imposed on the back of their heads, maybe with practical effects and like, Maybe he wrote it differently in like a more mm -hmm. hor horrific way, but they just couldn't do it with the budget, maybe. It, yeah, it's likely that more than anything else. But the last little bit, they tell Brent that they did it to save them from the others, uh, and Sam insists they won't hurt Brent. But he says it in a very sinister way. Now, immediately, when we laugh about this, it was like, we won't hurt you. We promise that they then immediately break by laughing really evilly and approaching Brent. And then it cuts to black and you're like, well, clearly you're not going to stick to that promise, are you guys? That's it. What is what is going to be, again, up there alongside the likes <clears throat> of Calling All Creeps is just one of the more unusual episodes we've seen. One where I can't quite decide if I like it or if I don't like it. Yeah, I think that is the perfect way to put it, is that it's super unusual. Um, I thought the uh, axing in it was pretty, pretty strong. The yeah boy that plays Sam I think he's doing his best to try and look terrified a lot of the time even though he's not got a lot to work with mm -hmm. like you said the with the door and things like that and the clown masks and stuff he's doing he's doing his very best <clears throat> Agreed. I thought this episode had like a bit of a dated feel to it I don't know if you've got the same sort of vibe but it feels like this is the 90s you know you said it feels like it just has that dated feel to it I thought I thought when I was reading up on it, I thought I was going to come across a factoid and, and find it was a cut episode from season one. It felt like it belonged in that level of early days, Goosebumps. It's true. That's why, that's why I feel like, yeah, I feel like it has that older feel to it. Um, but 
say what you will about Goosebumps, but these twists, man, they'd make M. Night Shyamalan blush. They would, wouldn't they? Like, come on now. The, you, you just can't pot it. Is it a good twist if it's like impossibly, you know, convoluted? You know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we had a discussion with um, uh, Camp Nightmare, and we agreed in that um, that it, a, a, it's not a good a, a good a bad twist is something you can never in a million years see coming, um, because that's that does you know. And even now, if you watch this back, you would struggle to work out where the signposts were because ultimately really twist as well should have occasional signposts for you to look back and go, oh, that's what that was. This doesn't have any of that at all. There's no implication in the slightest that there's anything alien related to this at all. Because then you ask the question about Roxanne and all that, and then you start going, well, why, if she's an alien too, and they're all aliens, why are they looking for ghosts? Why? So why are they looking for ghosts? And also, why is Brent like leaving notes? And if, if he not, if he is aware, is he like aware that he was made invisible by his parents so he could be like, well, he said so, it, he, yeah. so he's aware of that. So yeah, why is he interacting with them? Protect me. Like, mm. why is he interacting with them and like, yeah, like leaving notes and doing stuff to try and get them intrigued and like, yeah, it doesn't make any, that doesn't make any sense. So he's supposed to be in that. hiding. They could have fixed that with one line right at the end as well. Simply have Sam turn around and say to him, like during that last scene, well, why did you contact me? And him just mm. turn around and say, because I was lonely. Perfect. That would have that would have really saved it. Yeah. Well, why why I do quite like it is I think the concept of human beings like making figuring out some ways to a way to go invisible as like adapting to survive and maybe like maybe only worked on kids this invisibility so they like made the kids go invisible to make them help them survive and they had to try and survive in this hostile world that aliens took over i kind of like that idea for like a maybe a horror movie i think that'd be pretty cool but it's done in a and the ending of of course has a sort of like dark element as well because they're gonna presumably now eat this child or whatever they do with the back of their heads well, even <laughs> kind of reminded I... me of kind of reminded me of the um the girl that cried monster how that has that ending mm-hmm. where it turns out that actually they're all in on it kind of thing Agreed. I do. That's why I think it fits alongside it as well. I think as well, you can you can take things in this episode and apply it to what you told at the end and make it better yourself. So, you know, one of the things that you said darker is the idea that they enslaved humanity and sent us off to colonies effectively to be slaves. Uh, That's a cool idea. But I ended up wondering because one of the things I kept I noted Frey and I mentioned while we were talking was that it was a very stormy episode, very Mm -hmm. windy, very and all that. And I want to jump on and go for this reach, which is the alien invasion fucked up the atmosphere of Earth. And that's why we constantly have these heavy winds and storms. Yeah, I wonder if the book goes into greater detail mm. on that sort of thing. Because I just I do feel like there's something there, man. But it's just like they're hampered by the runtime, you know. This is sort of one where maybe... Always. Yeah, it always does hamper like great concepts. Mm. And if it had been dragged out a bit further, maybe more details, some more added lines here and there, you'd have something great. But instead it's bogged down by its runtime and which makes it uh, more of the middle of the road episode unfortunately agreed i think that's where it sits as well for me um nothing terrible yet in the season three nothing outstanding either but we have plenty to go it's a 22 episode run less than season two uh but you know it's 20 more to come you know what to do though you got any thoughts on my best friend is invisible let us know in the comments Thank you very much for watching. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Tumblr. Go to Patreon to help us out over there. That's patreon.com forward slash gbhbl as well as Big Cartel where you can find some of our merchandise. We have a podcast running on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. And of course, if you like this video, do us a favour, hit the subscribe button and help the channel grow. Games, horror and heavy metal. What else is life for?
Thank you very much for watching. You can check us out on GBHBL.com as well as on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Tumblr. Go to Patreon to help us out over there. That's patreon.com forward slash GBHBL as well as Big Cartel where you can find some of our merchandise. We have a podcast running on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. And of course, if you like this video, do us a favour, hit the subscribe button and help the channel grow. Games, horror and heavy metal. What else is life for?